Good to see you all. Thanks for being here. I'm really delighted to be here. It's something that's an uncommon pleasure and privilege for me this fall. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeff Mackey Mason, the Dean of the School of Information uh, and uh, Dean on leave. Uh, there's an acting dean at the moment who I'll introduce in a moment because I'm away, as many of you know, this fall. This is our ninth John Seely Brown Symposium on Technology and Society. It's a highlight of our academic year. It's an opportunity to bring thought leaders to campus to discuss with us the implications of technological advancements and society. Uh, we've had past speakers, including top thinkers like Dana Boyd, Aza Raskin, David Weinberg, Mimi Ito, Larry Lessig, you get the idea that this is an opportunity to bring really important thought leaders to this campus, and we're, we're so excited to be able to do that. It's made possible thanks to the support of the symposium's namesake, John Seeley Brown, who I'll introduce in a moment. JSB is an alum of the University of Michigan. Uh, he is also the former chief scientist of Xerox and was the director of the Xerox Park Research Lab for a number of years. He's a trustee of the MacArthur Foundation. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has a long list of other honors and memberships on boards around the world. He's currently the independent co-chairman of the Deloitte Center for the Edge and a visiting scholar at the University of Southern California. JSB's generosity has enabled us to bring great and stimulating thought leaders to campus, enhancing our reputation and opening our minds. Today I want to announce some really exciting news. JSB has made a generous new gift commitment, an endowment, to ensure that the symposium continues for years to come, indeed, forever. We will have this symposium every year into the future because of its generous gift. Please join me in thanking JSB. And JSB, will you stand up? As a result, it isn't just we who will benefit from the joy of this symposium every year, but all future generations, uh, students at the School of Information, students at the University of Michigan campus, alumni, faculty, staff from Ann Arbor and University uh, who come and benefit from this. JSB stepped forward with this leadership gift to help us kick off the school's fundraising campaign, Innovation, Inspiration, and Impact. This is part of the university-wide campaign that is beginning with a public kickoff next month on November 8th, the Victors for Michigan campaign. It's an important step in ensuring that we can continue to offer the best public education in the world going into the future in a time when the public is no longer supporting us as much as they used to. It's donors like JSB who enable us to bring the great learning, the great creation of knowledge and its sharing to this campus and to the world. We're grateful for the leadership gift and its profound impact on the school. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Finholt, our acting dean, who's going to introduce today's symposium speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Shwetak Patel. He is an uh, associate professor in the departments of computer science and engineering and electrical engineering at the University of Washington, where he directs the UBCOMP research lab. His research interests are in the areas of ubiquitous computing, sensor-enabled embedded systems, and human-computer interaction. He's particularly interested in developing easy to deploy sensing technologies for energy and health applications, which is the subject of his talk today. While still a doctoral student at Georgia Tech, Schwedek co-founded Sensi, a residential energy sensing and feedback company, which was acquired by consumer electronics company Belkin in 2010 for that tantalizing figure known as an undisclosed sum. <laughs> Based on this work, one can truly say that Schwedek is a house whisperer. He speaks the secret language of houses. In 2009, Dr. Patel received the TR35 award from MIT's Technology Review, uh, which annually features the world's 35 top innovators under 35. In 2010, he was named the top innovator of the year by Seattle Business Magazine. Seattle Magazine designated him the most influential person of the year in 2011. That same year, and still under the age of 30, Dr. Patel received two more distinguished honors, the Microsoft Research Faculty Fellowship and a MacArthur Fellowship, popularly known as the Genius Award. And I can say that I actually think the coolest part of that was he got introduced at halftime at a UW game, and he got to meet Dubs, the, uh, the, the real husky mascot of the University of Washington. My kids thought that was the most <laughs> important part. <so. laughs> 
In 2012, he was named a Sloan Fellow and received an NSF Career Award. Uh, but probably most important in 2012, Schwedek and his wife, Julie Keens, became the proud parents of Maya, probably their most interesting joint project. <laughs> I should also say that uh, Julie was recognized as a TR35 recipient this year, uh, leaving Maya as the only member of their household who hasn't received this honor, but she does have 34 more years of eligibility. <laughs> So now in 2013, uh, Schwedek's achieved yet another career milestone as our featured speaker at the 9th John Seeley Brown Symposium on Technology and Society. Please join me in welcoming Schwedek Patel. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's always great to listen to these introductions because it's interesting to figure out how people are explaining this work. It's a wisp how, wisp Home Whisperer is a new one, so that's another one I might start to use. Um, but no, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me out here. Um, I actually had a great day yesterday, and today, this morning was great. I did a design jam with a number of the HCI students, and that was ex exciting. Uh, my voice is starting to get a little hoarse because we were pretty, we got pretty intense in that, in that design jam, so I apologize about that. Um, but what I want to do today is share with you some of the research that we've been doing. Um, my lab is fairly broad in that I have students that work on embedded systems, hardware. We build integrated circuits. We we also work on machine learning, signal processing, we do a lot of technology based on applications, and we also focus on human-computer interaction. So my 14 PhD students kind of run the gamut in computing, all the way from low-level hardware to uh, uh, trying to address some challenging HCI questions. And, and, and what we really focus on is on applications that are really meaningful to us. And we typically use computer science, HCI, and electrical engineering as tools to support these application spaces. And a lot of the fundamental work in computing, I would say, has been driven by these new applications. You know, a lot of the interesting uh, breakthroughs have been coming out because of applications that we really haven't thought about. And it's really pushing the boundary in terms of what we can do with computing technology. And hopefully, I'm able to share a couple of these ideas with you and, and, and show, show you that these are good examples of that. It's the first time my phone's ever rang while I've given a talk. <laughs> Um, so, and, and, and hopefully the title will become more, uh, more apparent uh, as, as I present some of this work, but your noise is my signal, so what does that mean? Um, so the focus of this talk is going to be around some new technology that we've been building that can monitor electricity and water usage in your home. Um, and done it in such a way that you can give people actionable feedback about what they're consuming in their home. The other thing we're going to talk about is uh, mobile health sensing. So how can, you use the how can you leverage the mobile phone that everybody has with them as health monitors? And I'll show you some interesting ways of you can, how you can do that and what that can do with, to the health industry. And then this term, your noise is my signal. So a lot of the things that we do in the lab is kind of a lot of people would call off the wall and just kind of bizarre. And, and part of the way to characterize that is we look at signals in places that people don't really look at. Uh, people would ignore it. Um, you know, GPS is a good example where people are looking, signal, looking at signal in the noise. You know, GPS signals are so weak, but the receivers are able to pick it up even though they're buried in the noise. But we do something different. We look at the noise that's around us and pick out the interesting nuggets there. So we're not just trying to pick out real signal in the noise, we're using the noise for interesting reasons. And, and we'll show you how this line of work cuts through all these different application spaces we've been working on. So in the first area of work that we've been focusing on is looking at energy, re residential energy monitoring. And the goal really is to help consumers reduce their overall energy use. And, and it's interesting to look at how uh, people or utilities monitor residential energy use. Even to this day, utilities send out flyers that say, you know, it's summer. What are some of the appliances that you're going to use and how much are you going to use? Well, that self-report makes no sense because people have no clue on exactly what they're going to use and they you know, might not know about the other things that might be going on in the background. So right now, there's very little information about our residential use. But one of the challenges is to even provide consumers any feedback about that. There's very little uh, information about how much energy they're using at a granular level. So that technology really doesn't exist. Um, and, and so there, there's a huge disconnect in terms of what people are using and what they think they're using because that, that information is not even there. You know, you can, you can do a lot with this data, but the problem right now is the data sparse field. And so people often talk to me about how, you know, why are you focusing on, on the residential space? You know, isn't it the building that you're giving this presentation in that you should focus on? Isn't it the factory that you should be focusing on? Well, those are big consumers, but those are consumers where there's a lot of regulation around what you can do. This is a LEED certified building. There's a lot of regulation that you can employ to actually help mitigate and contain that. But in, a, in the residential space, there's actually no re regulation. In fact, it's really hard to know what kind of energy people are consuming. And residential, that pie is actually getting bigger. It's actually out of control, where there's buildings like this are actually getting more controlled. And so about a quarter of our energy use, electricity and gas, is about, it, it's quarter of our use is 
residential. The things that we do on our daily lives impact that quarter of the pie. Water is even more interesting. More than half of our potable water usage is in our homes. So this is potable water. So this isn't for irrigation and reclamated water. This is potable pumped water. More than half is in our homes. And, and, a lot, and the interesting thing there is 15% is unaccounted for. That's leaks where they don't even know where that water went. We saw something coming out of a pipe here, but we don't know, no meter was able to aggregate that to a, 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 a reconcile that number. And so a number of, a lot of it's just misused or just, or, or loss. But so, so the residential space is important because we don't have really have a lot of information about what's going on there. So this is an example a lot of people in environmental psychology use this, is they, they use this analogy of the grocery shopping experience, and you've probably seen this before, but the idea behind this is that, you know, a grocery shopping experience is when you, you, everything's labeled, you go out, you pick your purchases, you get a receipt that's itemized down to what you've purchased. Actually, Safeway does this cool thing where they break it down based on grocery, um, uh, refrigerated goods, general goods, so you can kind of get a sense of how much, in, how much money you're spending for each kind of item. Um, but what would it mean if you know, Safeway only gave you this little sliver of information, which was like, here's how much you owe, $527 on this experience. Um, and, and you might question that. You might actually ask, where's my real receipt? If you got a telephone bill and you didn't have the breakdown and you had a large bill, well, what would you say? Well, I want to know the numbers. Well, they give you the numbers, right? But what, happened, what would it mean if they didn't? Or a credit card bill like that. But it turns out that's exactly what utility bill looks like. This is something we've been using for the last 60 years, and we gladly pay the number that's at the bottom of the line there, which is you know, whatever we owe. They give you some numbers about kilowatt hours and CCF, these esoteric units that really don't make any sense. I mean, that's not going to tell you how much energy you're really using. Some of these bills actually do this th thing where, um, oops, sorry. They give you some graphs where how much energy you've consumed this month versus last month. But what happens if you had this anomaly? So this doesn't tell you much. I mean, I'm pretty flat and I have this big jump. That still doesn't tell you what happened there. So, so that's actually a real uh, a water bill that one of my colleagues at UW received. It's a $3,000 water bill. Um, and the first thing he does is not call Seattle uh, Public Utilities. He calls me. <laughs> um, it's like, it's like James, you should be calling somebody else. It's like, well, you do this stuff. You should figure it out. Well, you should have installed our sensors, first of all. But, so it turned out that he had a, a leak. $3,000 is basically about, uh, what is it, about a million gallons of water he wasted for, somewhere wasted for two months. So billing in Seattle happens every 60 days. This leak started roughly at the start of the first billing cycle, and 60 days later, he got a bill. Right? So billing is not even done often enough that you would have even detected this leak until 60 days later. And the other hilarious thing was in that package that they got, he got a little dye pack, which you're supposed to put in the toilet to detect if your toilet is running. Right? So it's this little thing that you put in there, and if your toilet is running, it actually changes color. Um, but it turns out, if you do the math, I got my undergrads to do the math, if every one of his toilets were leaking out of a three-quarter inch pipe coming into the house, physics sh says that you cannot consume that much water in 60 days. Right, so the utilities had no clue where the water went. They're like, oh, it's probably a toilet leak or whatever, right? But, but, but so, so what this really shows is that even the utilities have no clue where this water is going. It turned out they forgave that bill. So Seattle Public Utilities has this policy that um, if, you re if, you, if you fix the issue and you show you fix the issue, there's a one-time forgiveness, so you got lucky. But the unfortunate thing on the bottom was, uh, if you look at the bottom right, your account was automatically debited $3,000. <laughs> so he's like, I didn't even have that much money in the account because that was my utility account. Um, but, but you can kind of see where we are right now in terms of the kind of feedback you get. Um, but, you know, there's technology out there. Um, all right. So, so, so there's technology out there, and there's, it's your meter. It's this thing that's probably 50 to 60 years old. And, and the problem with this is you can't really go out there and read that thing because, I mean, it doesn't really tell you anything about... It tells you aggregate use, but you've got to really figure out how to parse that number. And so this is used for billing purposes and utilities. And it's this ugly thing on the side of your house that a lot of people try to hide. And now they have smart meters, digital meters, so people don't even, so meter readers don't even have to go out there. They just read the meter. And people are like, well, can't I just use a smart meter? But it turns out that made it easy for meter readers to read the meter. That information is not even fed back. And, and the other issue is that they don't collect the data on a daily basis to give you any breakdown. So, so the technology out there is really not focused for consumers. And, and, and traditionally, the way we've solved this problem is using a distributed sensor approach where you might buy a little sensor, you put it on in your microwave, you might put it on a coffee maker, bean grinder, it's obvious that I'm from Seattle, uh, refrigerator, and then all your lights. The problem with here is this is just a few appliances and look how it's, this is not scaling. You know, the average 1,000 square foot home has about 200 electronic devices, right? And so just think about those sensors and you can't even get behind things like the uh, refrigerator unless you pull it out and other hardwired appliances. And so distributed sensing doesn't work because you just can't install those sensors and if you have to replace batteries, it gets complicated. And so our lab has been focusing on ways to 
build new hardware and really make it into, into a machine learning problem where with a single sensor, can you use machine learning to infer exactly what you're using in your home? So instead of giving, getting you a bill that just tells you one number, it tells you a breakdown. It looks like, kind of like a credit card receipt. And so what would that mean? But the problem is how do you get that data? And so what we've been working on for the last couple of years is technology that gives you that. So on the electricity side, it's a sensor that plugs into the wall and it's one sensor. And I'll talk about how that works, but it, it uses this concept that there's electromagnetic interference that's coming out of your appliances that are already connected to your power lines to infer what's going on in your home. And you just need one of them, and this is something that a consumer can install. And the analogous technology for that, for water, is this device that screws on a hose bib. Again, you just need one of those, and it uses pressure noise to figure out, well, is it a toilet or is it a washing machine that went off? Um, and so our approach has been to use the utility infrastructure, the plumbing, the electrical, the gas that's already around us as the sensor. So you can use machine learning to infer what kinds of information can you glean from that. So we've built technology for electricity, water, and gas. I won't focus on gas. I'll just mainly talk about electricity and water and how that works and the implications for that technology. And so ElectroSense uh, is a device, like I said, single, single sensor that plugs into the electrical outlet. And, uh, and, and this is not, there's been other work in this space. In the 80s, people tried to do the single point sensing concept as well. So in the 80s, they called this non-intrusive load monitoring, where they instrumented your smart, or your, actually at that time it wasn't smart, they instrumented a meter to make it smart. And what they did was they looked at how much power you're consuming. And so if you see a, you know, a thousand watt device come on, well that might be your oven. Or if you see a hundred watt device come on, that might be your light bulb. So the people tried to do this back in the day when they were just using your power numbers at a given point to see what you turned on or turned off. But it turns out that doesn't work anymore. We have consumer electronic devices where if you look at all the devices and how much power they consume, they all look the same. Everything seems like it consumes about 100 watts. A digital video recorder, a laptop, a computer, a display, they're all about 100 watts. So everything looks the same. So that technique doesn't really apply anymore. Um, and so what we've done is, well, can, are there other signal sources that we can leverage to give us that information? And, uh, and so what we've done is look at the voltage. And it turns out that there's electrical noise on the power line. So how many of you have had this situation where a phone, you're about to get a phone call, a phone's doing something, and you hear this buzzing in a speaker? Right? You hear this, like, this just chattering that might happen. Um, that's actually an example of EMI radiation. So that's electromagnetic interference that's coupling to the nearest wire, and it's being played over the speaker. That's the acoustic version of the electrons that are flowing through the wire. And that's exactly what happens. My laptop plugged into the wall. Um, these lights connected to the electrical infrastructure. The side effect is that there's EMI noise. There's noise that's a side effect of the electronics that's being propagated over the power line. And why is that? Well, it's because that there's these little things called power supplies in there. And these power supplies are designed to take your 120 volt power and give you DC power at a few volts, so 12 volts or something like that, and to do it efficiently. You know, the old school way of doing that was you have a resistor and you dissipate it as heat. That's inefficient. You don't do that anymore. You basically use what's called switching power supply. And what that does is the side effect, a lot of people don't really notice, is that it has electromagnetic interference. So when these transistors are switching, these power supplies are switching, it's causing noise to go back on the power line. And it turns out, the noise is actually proportional to the kind of device it is. So, um, and, and, and you might ask, what kind of devices have power supplies like this? Well, everything. CFL light bulbs, LED lighting, your television, your little charger for your iPhone, gaming consoles, lots of consumer electronics devices have that. That's where we're moving because it's more energy efficient. They're smaller, they're easier and cheaper to manufacture. So here's a spectrogram. So a spectrogram is basically, if you look at your power line, um, you can think of these as radio stations. So each one of the appliances on your power line kind of occupies a radio station. So that's the noise that's being put out. So if I take a snapshot of a power line, look at all the things I can see in parallel. This is the PC, so its power supply it has a specific characteristic. Here's a CFL bulb, this is the washing machine going on and off. This is just monitoring the power line at one location. This is the electromagnetic interference that's on the power line that most people have been trying to cancel out or get rid of or don't really care about. Um, if I take a closer look, here's the TV. The TV does this interesting thing where it's moving in its frequency. That's actually the backlight changing as you're watching a movie, all right? So what you can see is, from the EMI noise, we can actually deduce a circuit model and say, look, that really looks like a CFL. No, that looks like a television. That looks like a charger, because the kind of power supply you have to build uh, is very uh, specific to that, uh, that de device and appliance, and so that EMI signature is proportional to it. So what we do is we take the EMI noise and reverse engineer exactly what device it is. And so that's where the machine learning algorithms come into play. And so these are the kinds of things that we can de detect. Coffee makers, microwaves, um, a lot of things that you might see. But there, there's some other subtle things here, like microwave door, refrigerator door, and oven door. You might say, well, how do you detect a door? It turns out when you open and close these doors, there's a light that turns on, right? And so subtle things like that we can detect, too. Those little LED lights, sort of CFL lights that come on when you open your oven to light it up, we see that. So there's 
really a lot of information that we can gather here. Um, it's not a perfect system. It's a machine learning based system, but we can get pretty close because we can use other heuristics like, well, you know, it looks like you're in the kitchen because I saw some oven activity, I saw a microwave, that light, that little light must be this door because it's timed right there, uh, timed in that way too. So we use a lot of other features there. So one of the things you might be wondering is, okay, that tells us what device it is, but how do I know how much power that device consumed, right? Just because I'm plugged in over here, I, I, there's no way I can figure out how much power that light is consuming. So there's a second sensor, right? So if you don't have a smart meter or if you don't have a way of getting power data, the, the way you're supposed to do it is you go inside this breaker panel. It's a pretty scary device to get into. You unscrew this thing and you see those dangerous wires. All those are electrically hot. The moment you touch one of those, you're gonna get zapped, right? And so they ask you to put this little current clamp in there. That's not gonna happen. Um, and so that's the current standard. You put these CTs in there, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's a pretty hot wire. Um, and it requires usually an electrician. So what we did was we built a device called the contactless power meter. You can call this a stick on power meter. So it's a little device that you literally pull the sticker off the back and you put it on the outside of your breaker panel. All right, so you go to your switch box and you put it on the outside. There's little LEDs on there that acts as stud finders kind of. And it says, okay, I find the wires, I put them right there and it monitors the entire power usage of your home. And so what it does is it's actually detecting the magnetic field from behind the, from the panel. And this is actually an incredibly hard problem because what do you have in between? A giant piece of metal, right? Um, and so, so there's some uh, uh, non-linearity effects that we had to take into account for, but this is an easy way to get whole home power. So this device that you put on the outside of your breaker panel and the device that you plug in tells you how much power each device consumes. So those are the only two things that you need, all right? Um, so uh, let me talk about water sensing and I'll talk about the user interfaces in a little bit. So water sensing, we're trying to do something very similar. Is there an easy way to do this from a single point? Water is even more challenging because you, know, you have to cut into a pipe. Um, and, and, and that requires a plumber or that could actually be catastrophic. And, and there's actually, there's very few smart water meters out there. So you can't even really rely on meter, smart water meters. In fact, a lot of water metering, uh, some, some of you may not be aware, is they don't even meter your water. What they do is they charge you a base amount. They assume that you consume 100 gallons a day and they charge you for that every month. And they read your meter once a year and they correct that number. So, one, so in December, you might get a very large bill or you might get a credit, all right? So they don't even come out because it's not even worth it for them to come out there because half the time that water meter is in a house or it's buried under a bunch of dirt that you have to clean up, right? So it's not worth them to have a meter reader coming out. Um, and so the, the plumbing infrastructure is really similar to the electrical in that there's an analogous EMI noise concept. Here it's pressure noise, right? When you flush a toilet, when you run a water valve, there's these changes in pressure flow or, or pressure changes that happen that's actually proportional and also indicative of what kind of load it was. And the cool thing is you can actually put a sensor anywhere. You can put it on a hose bigot, I can put it under a, a, a bathroom or a bathroom sink, or I can put it uh, at the water heater. They're all interconnected. It's a giant plumbing system that's all tied together at the water heater. And so when a pressure change happens, you see it everywhere. So I only need one of them. Um, and so that's an example of a device screwed onto a hose bin. That's an easy way to get to. That's analogous to plugging something into a wall. Um, and, and it turns out, you know, faucets, toilets, and tubs look different. Well, why do they look different? Well, they look different because of the valving characteristics. You know, the flapper valve in a toilet is designed for a very different reason than a manually activated hand valve versus an electromechanical valve in a laundry machine. And that shapes the waveform. So these waveforms, these pressure waveforms, tell us what kind of device it is. But the other thing that's interesting is we can tell multiple toilets apart. Right? Because the, way, the, the location of the toilets actually changes the waveform in terms of its, you know, you know, its dampening, where it's located. The shape is the same that tells us it's a toilet, but there's other parameters that tell us. So that's a different one from this other one because of where it's located. So we can pinpoint, you know, there's three toilets in there, and here's the consumption to each one of them. And so this allows you to do water consumption sensing. And so what can we do with this data? And so this technology has been deployed in a number of different homes. This was um, uh, uh, the technology that was mentioned earlier, that Zensi, that we started a company and it was acquired by Belkin. And so we have this incredible data set that we can look at now. It's a very rare opportunity where an academic can look at a huge data set without having to actually you know, cobble together these prototypes anymore. But one of the things we're looking at is well, what, what are people doing with a, a device and, and actually introduce different user interfaces to see how we can create eco-feedback interfaces and see what can provide actionable feedback. And so the other thing is providing comparisons. Are there ways that we can provide better data about how they compare to other people? And I'll talk about that, how we do that in an interesting way. And then also an interesting challenge for us right now is balancing privacy and utility. There's a lot of value add for some people about getting this information, but there's a huge privacy implications, there's huge privacy implications as well. Because when you saw that list of things, I mean, you could kind of tell what people have in their home. Do they have an Xbox or not, right? So you're getting at these new questions about how do you balance privacy and utility and who sees the data? 
So let me just, actually, I might just show you my real data. All right, so this is data from my house. Um, uh, so we, looks like the internet is not connected, so that's why it's, it, so I, I, I loaded this up at the jam, but it hasn't updated yet. So th this is a simple, this is one dashboard. So this is something that I would see on my phone. Um, and so, and, and so you, you see the typical things you see on, a, uh, on an energy bill, how much I owe and how much I've consumed and how much I'm consuming right now. Um, so the, the family is already out, so they're daycare and my wife's at, on campus now. And then I also can get a sense of how much energy I've consumed the last couple of days. Um, I've been away and so there's not a lot of energy use. On the, uh, so there's a lot of energy use four days ago. We had a little mini um, Halloween party, so there are a lot of stuff going on then. But the cool thing is at the bottom where it's the breakdown of my top 14 consumers in my house. So for this month, this percentage tells me how much energy is going to that particular appliance or device. Um, and it changes depending on what season. When it, in summer, my HVAC was up there and not my lighting. In Seattle, we don't have a lot of air conditioning, but if you do, it's only you know, running maybe once or two, week, two, once or week, one or two weeks out of the year. Um, and the green tells me that the thing is on. So sometimes what we do is we quickly look at it to see, is everything turned off? Right? That's the simplest thing we can do. Um, but, but this was eye-opening because me being an uh, energy researcher, I actually didn't know what well, a lot of things were happening in, behind the scenes, where things were out of sight, out of mind, and I didn't really know what was going on. Uh, a big one for me is the cable box kind of jumps out, right? And I'll show you another example, another house, where cable boxes and DVRs are interesting because when you turn the power off, the light turns off, but the thing is still running at full blast behind the scenes. Because it, why? Because it's got to record your movie, it's got to record your TV show, it's got to keep the TV guide going, and it doesn't comply to Energy Star. There's a loophole in the system that allows them not to comply to Energy Star. But I'll tell you how we were able to solve that actually later on. Later on. Um, so, uh, and so, so these were things were eye opening. I had no clue that that, that little thing, right, consuming 16% of my energy use. Um, but, 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 th but this is something that, you know, if somebody wants to look at the data, this is one way to look at it. All right. Um, so, uh, water looks really similar. Um, water, um, $18. You might not think that's a lot. That's because I'm only showing water. For every gallon of water you consume, and if you have a sewer system, if you don't have a septic tank, you pay about 10 to 20 times in sewage. So our water bills are actually over $100. In fact, our water bills are more expensive than electric bills because for every gallon of water you consume, you pay a lot for sewage. So for every gallon of water you save, you actually save a ton of money because sewage is very expensive. Um, but I'm only showing water here. And so there's a lot of activity going on today because my wife's parents were around, uh, the, the cleaning crew was in the house. So. Uh, this was another story I was telling the Design Jam uh, teams uh, where we had an unintended consequence where one of my colleagues was asking, you know, how is your cleaning crew for your cleaning your house? I'm like, She's, they're great, but they're not doing a good job in my house. They're like, well, I'll just bring up the data. Here's when they came in. Looks like they flushed the toilet enough to consume 14 gallons, right? Looks like they were running the dishwasher, the sink, and look, I mean, the showers, 15 gallons worth of shower use, right? So they must have been doing something in the house. So it's kind of an interesting question about tra trading off the utility and the privacy and something I never really thought of until you know what, actually I know what happened that day, right? Um, but, but, but this kind of gives you a breakdown of your water usage. And the interesting thing here is that GPM number, it better say zero, right? If I'm not home or nobody's home. Uh, and so one of the things we do is we'll set that up so that I'll get a message when we're on vacation. If it's not zero, we'll get an alert. Likely it's a leak or something's happening, right? And we'll call over a neighbor or somebody to take a quick look. Um, but there was another in interesting situation that happened when we were on vacation where a toilet got flushed. There was water consumption. Nobody was supposed to be in the house. We're like, oh my gosh, this is a leak. We're across the other side of the country. What are we going to do? Turned out, my, I sent my students, so I was, what I do is students figure it out. Technology is broken. <laughs> um, but it wasn't. It turned out that the cats learned how to flush the toilet. <laughs> so they were standing on the bowl and pushing the thing, and they were flushing the toilet. So that was quite interesting. I wish I had a video at that moment, right? Um, but, they, but they deduced that it was the cats flushing the toilet. I was like, well, you need to give me some evidence here. Um, but apparently that's what, that was the situation. <laughs> Um, so that's water. And so one of the things we found in these deployments is surprising insights. So this is a picture of a photo that, they, that was taken for a book called The Human Face of Big Data. So this was a book that was recently uh, published where they took ph photographs of lots of different projects like around the world where they showcased examples of big data. Right? So they actually had a picture of somebody doing EKG research. And if you had to print out all the data you collect during a one-hour period on those old school dot matrix printers, what would that paper reel look like? Right? So they were just covered with paper. And so they wanted to do something with us where they're like, well, how can we do a shot about energy use? And so this was a home in San Francisco. They took all the appliance out of the house and staged it in the, in the backyard and aligned them in such a way that you can show the big consumers in the front and the lower consumers in the back. And so the photographer was Peter Menzel. So Peter Menzel has done these great shots. He, uh, he did this uh, book called Material World where he took the contents of people's homes around the world and put it on the front doors or front, uh, front line. 
And it was eye-opening to see what somebody in North Carolina would have versus Cambodia, right? And he did this thing where he did a book called What the World Eats. He did the same thing, took the contents of the kitchen, put it on their, uh, on the dining room table. What, is what do people in Cambodia eat versus North Carolina, right? And it was really eye-opening to see that. So that's what he wanted to do here was energy use. And, and, and so this was a four-day photo shoot. This was probably the most ridiculous photo shoot I've ever been involved in. But it was fun. It was like, okay, I got to do this. It's Peter Menzel. I cannot say no. And so this is all their appliances out, right? I mean, so they hired a crew. You can see the crew on the left. It's a ridiculous crew to do this. Um, this is the final shot. This was in the New York Times. It was also in the book. I'm on a, on, I'm on a giant ladder holding the two sensors with the iPad in the middle. And Peter's on a, on a cherry picker taking this photograph. And there's lights in the backyards of these other homes on cherry pickers as well. Ridiculous setup for one picture. And, and this is, he wanted to time it so it was a uh, sunset. Or, 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 he wanted a sunrise and a sunset, and he did two pictures. And, but it took eight hours of setting up for the photography and two days of setting up for the scene for one picture. But anyway, um, so, so what was interesting here was uh, they wanted to have the big consumers in the front and the, and the smaller in the back. And one of the things we did, we installed our technology in their house, and we interviewed the homeowners. Uh, so they're in the back right there in the table. Uh, on the table back here, and they were completely off in terms of what they thought their big consumers were. So, so the, the big consumer was their pool pump. All right, that's an obvious one. You see the pool on the right, that's a pretty big consumer. But it turned out that they actually didn't realize how much energy it was consuming in terms of the different modes. So the device that we installed allowed them to help, help them actually set it up to a different mode where, you know what, this mode actually consumes more because they didn't have a good mental model of how the pump even worked. But this was a way for them to experiment, which was kind of interesting. Um, the second big consumer was lighting. Well, it's one of the things they didn't think about. They were like, oh, in the Bay Area, we get enough light. Well, lighting was there actually number two. Number three, they did not have a big, they had no clue about was the DVRs. The 13% of the entire usage across the year, actually. Number three was the DVR, the thing that just, they didn't think was on all the time. Um, and um, the TV was four, so they had this issue where the TV would also not go to sleep, and one TV the kids would keep on all the time. That was number four. And the thing that they thought there was the biggest consumer other than the pool pump was kitchen appliances. But if you added all the kitchen appliances together, the refrigerator, the oven, the electric stove, it, cons it, it accounted for less than 5% combined, right? So, so there's a disconnect in terms of what, what people see. Oh, I do kitchen activities, I take a shower, that's the big consumer. But it's the things that are out of sight that may be the big consumer. Um, so the other thing that we've been able to do is we generate these reports. So when you go in and log in to pay your bill, you get a report. Um, and so this is a, 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 a report that you can get. And so on the right here is a breakdown down to labels. So obviously the device can't tell you if it's whose laptop it is or, or where it is because we don't have that spatial relationship. But when you install the sensor or when you label it on the website, it actually remembers it forever. And so here you can actually, if you have some time, label the different devices because right now it'll say unknown TV1, unknown TV2. But you can quickly figure out, oh, that's the one in the kitchen, that's the one in the living room. And when you label it, then you get this breakdown. You can create these reports. And now you, have, you know how much the kid's laptop is running and, and really get a breakdown there. So this is an energy report down to the appliance level. This is really similar to an energy report that a utility might do based on your insulation and heating and HVAC. But this is at the appliance level. Uh, so this is another thing that you could do. And so the idea here is you log in, you can, see, you can download the app, you can look at that at any time, or you can get the report. But the other thing we wanted to do was continue paper bills. A number of consumers still use paper bills. They still get a monthly bill. And so we wanted to figure out how we can augment the paper bill in an interesting way. So some of you may actually get O-Power bills, these bills where you get this insert that compares you to your unknown neighbor, right? Uh, it's an aggregate number. It says, you know, here's how much you've consumed, here's how much your neighbor, similar neighbors consume, and you're ranking number five or ten. This is a, a similar to that, but it takes it one step further. So it gives you the top eight consumers for that month. It tells you how you compared to last month, normalized to the, um, uh, to, uh, to, to the weather. So it'll go to the next previous year if, if you're changing seasons. The thing on the right is really interesting where it compares you to your neighbor. And one of the things we're doing is we're comparing you to neighbors that are, have a similar house, but we're actually using some of the electrical information to infer how many people do you, might, do, you, do you have in your home to actually do a fair comparison. We're not going to compare a two-person household to a five-person household. We're, just, we're trying to infer the, the number of individuals in the household by using the activity data. The other thing it shows you is how you compare to your neighbor at, at an appliance level. And, and we're doing that by trying to match up as much of the appliances as possible. So we don't know exactly what TV you have, you don't, we don't know, unless you label it, but we kind of have a good idea. It looks like it's a roughly a, this size TV because of the power profile, and so we're comparing 
trying to do an apples to apples comparison because same household size, same uh, temp climate, temperature, and similar kind of devices. So is it a behavioral thing? Is it your appliance is actually malfunctioning? What is it? And so in this particular person that got this bill, they're doing really well except for the dishwasher were 50% higher than, and so what was going on there? And so that gets people thinking about, well, what, is it a behavior thing or, or, or what is it there? And then we also, also provide actionable tips. So if we saw a significant amount of refrigerator usage, we could probably suggest you might want to clean the uh, air coils underneath your refrigerator because when they get dusty, your refrigerator performance dramatically degrades because it's, you know, you're, you're trying to cool the system where there's not a lot of efficiency, and that's something a lot of people forget about. <laughs> Uh, vacuums under the refrigerator other than me, right? Um, and and uh, there's other things that are subtle, like um, uh, uh, draining your water heater every six months, because that actually can improve the efficiency of electric water heaters as well. So there's these things that we can actually provide actionable feedback, but tell you how much it helped, right? It's not just the laundry list of things to do, it tells you how much it helped. And so we keep, keep consumers engaged based on what they could do, but also how they compare across uh, different households. So this is a bill from uh, ComEdison. So ComEdison is a utility in, um, in Chicago that has this technology. Um, and so this technology, it's been really exciting to see how it's been adopted. So right now, the technology is actually being integrated into meters. So we've envisioned this technology as a device that plugs in an outlet where a consumer can install. And there will. So Belkin will build a consumer electronic device that you can go buy from Amazon. That's going to happen. Um, but what really happened was they took our board they put it into the smart meter. Now when you install a smart meter, now it's really smart. So this actually is a smart meter. So it monitors the power, it monitors the EMI noise, sends it to the cloud, the machine learning algorithm is at a cloud, and you get these apps. You can have an app on your phone, you can actually get the printout, uh, the, the printed bill, you can actually see the report when you go to pay your bill. So there's many different touch points that we have with the consumer. Um, and so, and so, when, you know, so that, that's, I mean, this is an amazing uh, scene where that's the first smart meter that we had instrumented with our technology being installed by a ComEdison employee. Um, so this, they go up. I mean, we were cringing when we saw this because they're hot swapping this. They pull the meter and they, they jumper the wires because they, when they pull the meter, they don't want the power to turn off in the house. It's a big jumper cables, right? And so they pull it out and they hot swap it. And there's sparks going everywhere. We're like, oh, God. I mean, spark, I mean so, but it was designed. It, it, it just did a great job of designing it. It worked. Uh, um, but what we're able to do is we're able to get these really nice energy use data sets that the DOE and other organizations can use about energy use in the home, doing regional differences, looking at where, where energy is really going because we don't have a lot of information about that. But the other thing that's been interesting that people have been using this for is conservation activities. So you might have seen a lot of activities where utilities send CFL, LED light bulbs out to you know, save energy, but we don't really know if they work. First of all, we don't know if they install it. Second of all, does it really work? So this is a way to actually evaluate conservation programs as well. So we can see, oh, you know what? You did install those bulbs, and it did help, or it didn't help. Here's some other things you could do. So it's a way to actually account for some of these conservation activities because we don't have the numbers there right now. Um, and the federal government has very strict, has a very aggressive 20, I think 2020 goal that every, every state has to basically hit a 10% reduction in residential energy by 2020. That's hard, 20%. So the, one of the issues is how do you account, how do you actually figure out you hit that? And how did you hit it? And so that's why this feedback is critical to the utilities and uh, to, to really figure out what do you want to focus on because it's very regionalized, right? Because some regions you might focus on, on, on a campaign on, around lighting. Other regions you might focus on something else. And so this gives you that information. Um, and also it's informing appliance design manufacturers. Well, what can we embed in our products to make it easier for you to get power information so you don't have to you know, look at the noise and go around, I mean, do this hackish way of getting at it. So the bottom left is a really, uh, uh, it, it, bottom left is a picture of me talking to Secretary Chu a few years ago, and that's when I showed him the data about the, um, the DVR. So I had enough data that I collected that, you know, Comcast, Xfinity, all these folks that have DVR um, cable boxes are consuming a significant portion of the energy on the grid. Right? They, don't, they, they actually don't comply with Energy Star because it's an entertainment device. It, it, it has different regulations. Technically, it's really easy. If my undergraduate capstone class built a DVR where it didn't go to sleep when it's not doing anything, I would fail them. Right? But, but here, they wanted to save $2, and that, that, it's not implemented that way. Right? Um, and so I talked to Secretary Chu. Secretary Chu and I come up, came up with a plan where we're working on a program where we're going to make the uh, DVR systems comply with Energy Star. In fact, you're already seeing that. So the smaller Motorola DVRs, if you, any of you have Comcast or Xfinity, is a, a device that goes to sleep, right? And that has significantly helped. Um, and, and so this is something that nobody, people kind of knew, but I had the data. You can't argue with the empirical data there. And so that just was a, uh, when I was um, briefing the secretary about that work. So I want to switch gears a little bit. So I talked about how noise can be a useful way of getting at energy use data and feeding that back to consumers, and there's a lot of stuff we can do with that. But another thing that we've been applying this concept to is home health sensing. And I think home health is really interesting in that I think we have a unique opportunity uh, in health to increase the quality of care 
while we're reducing costs. I mean, this is a mind-boggling thing. What, you can make care better and quality? And, and I mean, then this is something that I actually testified in front of Congress in front of a couple months ago where I was making a case on the reason why mobile phones and uh, devices like this, we want to have different regulations and expedite this in the FDA process because they're going to play a critical role. And one of the things that we've been looking at is home health sensing and looking at how can you use the mobile phone as sensors for physiological information. And so what we've been looking at is how can we use the sensors that are already packed in the phone? I mean, eventually the phone's not going to have every sensor. You can't put an EKG sensor, you can't put a blood pressure monitor, you just can't put everything on there. But there is going to be a core set of sensors you're going to have on the phone, and what are the composite sets of algorithms you can build to, to, to basically teach them new tricks, right? A microphone is just for audio and listening to voice and, and accelerometer for detecting if the phone's tilted or not, right? But there's other things you can do with that, and, and that's what we've been focusing on. And we've done things like heart rate monitoring, blood pressure monitoring, with no instrumentation to the phone. This is using a commodity smartphone. Um, we've done things like lung function, and this is using signals on a body in a different way. So physiological sensing is typically, in the medical field, is you, know, you have a particular phenomenon you're detecting, you have a sensor for that. Uh, for that phenomenon. But what we're looking at, there's other signals on the body that are a proxy for that same physiological phenomenon. And so how can we use a phone and some machine learning to actually get at that information? And so that's what we're looking at. It's how can we enable phones to become sensors so we can enable self-management and start to enable uh, uh, clinicians and physicians to actually start to think about what are other ways that they can get at this data. So, uh, so, when it, so what I, want, I won't talk about heart rate and blood pressure. I'll talk about lung function. I only have time to talk about one. And, 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 and this is a technique called spirometry. So some of you may or may not know about this, but spirometry is a, basically a measure of lung function. You know, cardiologists might use an EKG, ECG. Pulmonologists use spirometers, all right? So a spirometer is a device um, on the bottom left. Uh, looks like a giant refrigerator-like device. Yeah, it's a big tube. You blow into it. You blow as hard as you can, take as much air as, you, out as possible. You almost get lightheaded at the end. You've got to almost faint when you get to the end of that. Uh, so you're pushing out as much air as possible. And what they're doing is looking at a flow volume curve to see how healthy your lungs are. There's obstruction, restriction. And that's the mainstay on how you diagnose chronic asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis, any pulmonary ailment. Right? Um, but one of the challenges is that's the refrigerator size device on the left. You can't take that home. There's one in the middle that's a clinical device. That's about a ten dollars to $20,000 device. You could take that home if you could afford it. Uh, insurance doesn't pay for that. There's one on the right that's a home spirometer, all right? And that's you know, 10 to 20 bucks you can buy at Walgreens or any, any uh, a drugstore. Problem is, it only gives you a peak flow number. It gives you one number, and it turns out the pulmonology community don't buy that number anymore. So you can have this, you can have this device, and you can log it as much as you want, but the pulmonologists won't even look at it because they want the full curve. They've got to have all the data because it turns out peak flow doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, and so there's, a, there's, there's this need on, and the, the reason why self-management is important in the pulmonary space is, let's say you have, you know, let's say you have chronic asthma and you're titrating your albuterol. Um, the problem is you've got to keep going back to clinic to get the spirometry measured before they can titrate it. Well, if you could do it at home, that would save a huge a burden, especially for a lot of folks that are in rural areas where they need to do this. But also for COPD and other drugs where you've got to do a spirometry measure, these drugs aren't even available right now because because the FDA assumes that there's no spirometer you can have in the home. So what we said was, well, we'll, tr we'll try to attack the hardest problem possible, which is, can we make a phone into a spirometer? All right? So here's, what a spir here's what one thing that you get from a, sp uh, a spirometer. It's a flow volume curve. How much air can you expel over a certain amount of time? And, and this, the top is a healthy curve. And on the bottom is just an example, just a really simple example. Here's obstruction. There's a scooping. And, and, and restriction is you don't quite hit the peak, and then you see a drop off. And th so they need to see the curve. But the peak flow meters right now just have a spring-loaded ball in them, and that doesn't give you any information. So they really need to see that. Um, and so we, what we did was we built um, uh, an application called SpiraSmart. It's a mobile phone spirometer. But the interesting thing about this is it doesn't require any additional hardware. It's a complete software solution. You go to the Android market, you go to the iPhone store, and download the app, and it turns your phone into a spirometer. And, and, and the interesting thing about putting this on a phone is something that people might have with them. So if it's individuals that need to do multiple readings throughout the day, likely they'll hopefully have their device with them. The other thing is already connected to the network, so we can send that information to the personal health record. But also, we have a screen. We can actually provide real-time feedback on things like incentive spirometry. There are, some, there are some things that you could do. So one of the challenges is you don't have a nurse with you anymore. Because when you do a spirometry measure, you have a nurse sitting next to you, motivating you and telling you, that's not good enough. You, got, you really have to push it out, right? Uh, it's an effort-dependent test but we can actually provide some feedback on if you're doing, if, is this your best effort? So you've got to have something in the loop to really be encouraging. So, so you have an opportunity there with the screen. And uh, so here, here's how it works. Um, let's see if I... So you hold the phone, arms reach away. There's no mouthpiece, there's no tube. Uh, it's just using the microphone. And so you hold it, arms reach away. 
and you just literally blow at it. So here we created a visualization where we want to emulate the ball falling down. Because a lot of people knew how that worked. So their mental model was, I got to keep that ball afloat. And so in this example, we actually created for those patients a, the, the, a digital floating ball. And so they had to keep it afloat for six seconds so that, as they were doing the maneuver. But that's all they do. They blow at the phone. And then when they're done, the ball falls down. And immediately, they get their flow volume curve and the numbers, all right? So in the, in, the, in, the, in the final version, we're actually not going to show the curve at all because the, you know, the patients don't really know what to do with it. But it computes it really quickly. Um, and, and, and it gives you the numbers. But, but so the basic numbers are calculated there. But the actual flow volume curve and the real, the accurate numbers are actually done in the cloud. And so these features are sent over the network. And, and we're actually, the more advanced machine learning algorithms are actually running behind the scenes. And what that serves up are three different views. So if data comes back to the phone where they actually get their full result. So they get the whole result there on the phone. Um, another version is actually sent to their personal health record. So this is actually integrated with the existing spirometry systems like NDD and all these existing manufacturers. We comply with that. So we're like, we're not going to create our own thing. We're just going to do what everybody else does. So right now, it just looks like an off-the-shelf device. And so whenever a pulmonologist is go th going through all the tries, they, they see it right there. And then the third one is automated, automatic overreading. So one of the challenges that we ran into, which is obvious in a lot of this work, is you have more data than you can handle, right? Now you have 1,000 readings coming in per patient than 10, all right? And so this actually does automatic scans and thresholding to say that, is this above certain thresholds? And it automatically does the triage before anybody looks at it. So the triage is happening automatically. If there's some questions, then a nurse the nurse will look at it or the physician will look at it. So it's already part of their practice, but we triage it automatically. And so how does this work? Um, so traditional spirometers use a flow sensor. So there's a, like a, so on the bottom left, is there's something that looks like a turbine. So as you're blowing through it, you're pushing air through it, and there's flow. And you look at that flow over a certain amount of time. And that's how clinical and home spirometers work. But we only have a microphone. So how do you get away with that? Um, and it turns out we use this trick with uh, vocal tract resonances. So the, the right is, an, ex is ex an example of what your vocal tract looks like. And what we're really doing is the microphone is picking up the audio data, but we're actually using the human body or the vocal tract as the sensor. So when you're blowing out and you have restriction, you create these resonances that we can see in the audio spectrum. Um, or if you have a constriction, we see that. And so these are all subtle changes that happen in the audio spectrum that actually causes tons of problems for speech recognition researchers. So, so in speech recognition, you're trying to get the most accurate, audible sound that you can get. And one of the things they do is they have a vocal track model, which is trying to cancel out all the wheezing and the, the hissing and people's tones and these subtle effects of their throat, and they cancel it out because that's something that causes a problem with the recognition. But we said, we're going to turn that problem on its head. And we took that same concept, took the vocal track model, and used the noise that everybody in the last 40 years have been canceling in speech recognition technology. And we've actually amplified that up and said that that actually gives you a profile of your vocal track. And in fact, that's actually a better way to sense a pulmonary obstruction. If you think about it, right, if you use a tube, that's an indirect way of doing it. We're actually listening to what's happening as the air is moving through your vocal tracts. And in a way, that's actually a better way of doing it. Um, so they're both inferred, obviously, but this is another way of doing it. And so this was a this was a project that took one of a few projects. It's probably the project that had the longest lead time from conception to publication. This was a three-year project. We came up with this idea, worked on the algorithms, worked on the data collection. It took three years before we wrote our first paper. Right? In computer science, it's unheard of. What, you didn't publish anything in six months? No, no, this is not an easy problem. Um, the part of it was, how do you evaluate this? So we did this clinical study where we had people you know, use an NDD or a high-end clinical spirometer. You know, we, we didn't use the cheap one. We used the $20,000 clinical spirometer and used the SpiroSmart app. So we had 52 patients that did the initial study. And, and they would use the, we counterbalanced, so they used one device over the other. And, and it was a proper clinical study. Um, and we had 52 patients with a variety of different conditions. And it was amazing, because we were able to get within 5% of a clinical spirometer. Uh, and, and what that means is that's already within the FDA gu guidelines in the variance of a spirometer. So if you use a clinical spirometer today and you use one tomorrow and you're a healthy person, you already have a 5% variation day to day, right, in the, in the device. So we're within the clinical variation. So this is like, okay, well, this is interesting. And, and, and so we said, okay, so the numbers look good. Well, what can physicians do with this? And so what we did on the bottom was we actually played this game with uh, physicians where we had a couple of their patients use the SpiroSmart app and we swapped the charts. 
All right. So, so they didn't know what it was. So it looked just like it was a clinical spirometer. The data looked just like that. We didn't mess with the, the printout. It was exactly the same. But the data was gathered by the, by Spirosmart, and we had six clinicians do this, and it and every single one of the diagnoses were spot on, even with with restriction, constriction, and a, a, a healthy function. They were spot on. But the thing that was interesting was when it failed, because even when you use a clinical spirometer, you could do something where you you kind of take a breath in the middle of a blow, or you might move the, move the, move the uh, mouthpiece, and you see these problems, right? But when SpireSmart fails, it fails in a really different way, because there are some failures we showed them, too, because we wanted to show them anomalies, too. They're like, a, spir a spirometer doesn't do that. We're like, well, it wasn't really a spirometer. Because, so that, which, which shows that there's, you know, we really have to talk, work with the mental model of how this technology works, because it's very different, because clinicians know when a spirometer fails, or how people do an improper technique, or how they've done an improper technique. Improper techniques on SpireSmart looks very different. In fact, it looks completely different. Um, and so there's this interesting uh, debate on, well, do we morph the results to look like a spirometer, or do we teach them about this? So that's something we're working on right now. But, but that was interesting when we did this study where they were able to read the charts, which was just fascinating. Um, and so there's really some new challenges. So incentive visualizations. I showed the ball example. So we have a number of students, even the med school, working on this, where they're looking at, well, what are some other incentive graphics that you could do to m encourage people to have better technique? All right. Um, automated overreading, that was critical, and that's something that we're, we're doing already. But one of the challenges that we're running into now is over-testing. So when you give somebody this app, they could actually go into uh, a, a mode where they're testing too often, and you can actually, uh, 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 people can actually exhibit things like bronchospasms, for example. You can actually do this test too, so often that you're actually creating an asthma attack. Um, and so there's these challenges where um, you know, the phone locks down after you do a certain number of tests, over a certain period of time, it just turns off. It's like, well, you know, you've done too many, you should rest. Um, and so, so there's these little subtle things that we had to do. Um, and right now, we're in the midst of doing another clinical trial. We're doing a larger study with a larger cohort, um, and we're going through FDA. And we're actually working with the med school in doing FDA, because a lot of these projects you throw over the fence, you, you really have to have the inventors involved, because it's just such, you have to be involved in that team. And so, uh, so we're actually going through FDA, and FDA was a fascinating process for us, where we go to the FDA, we're like, here's what we have. They're like, oh, this is easy. Spirometer, here's how you test a spirometer. You take a three liter syringe, you put it in the tube, and you push three liters of air through it, and you see if your device has three liters. We're like, FDA, we don't have a hole to put that into. We don't have a tube. I mean, how, what am I going to do with a three liter syringe? Am I just going to blow it at the phone? And so, and so it required a lot of educating. They're like, what do you mean you're using a phone? Just, just connect a device to it. Well, no, that's not the point, right? And so, so it, it required a lot of educating on the FDA's part as well as us, because we're learning this as well. And, and some of the concerns were, like, um, uh, were around, you know, uh, the, the, not just the validity of the device, but what, you could, what can happen to the application. And so their response was, okay, we'll let you do it, but it has to be locked down. Your phone can only be a spirometer. <laughs> That defeats the purpose. I mean, I don't want a phone that only does spirometry. You got to make phone calls. I got to text messages. I got to play Angry Birds, um, and so and they said, well, okay, but if you play Angry Birds, what happens if you're playing Angry Birds and it crashes your app? I say, oh, well, that's true, but it turns out you can actually monitor resources on the phone. That if you have, if you're below a certain amount of memory, if there's, you know, if you're taxing the processor from another process, we'll lock it down. So we had to go through this huge risk analysis about every everything that could happen. Where okay, the microphone's dirty. You dropped it in a toilet. Uh, or you have a case on it. So we had to go through this entire risk analysis with FDA and talk about what you could do. So we're going through this process. So we may actually be one of the first to get FDA approval for a, uh, for a mobile phone app as a clinical instrument. All right, there's four or five of us going through at the same time, so one of us will get through. But, but what really helped was um, in, in December, President Obama had this mandate where they basically si appropriated a significant, significant amount of funding to FDA to look at mobile phones as health sensors. And that really set, up, set them up to actually look at this, because when the folks that we're dealing with, there are only two of them, whereas there's 100 folks looking at drugs, right? So it was a really slow and arduous process, but that's actually been sped up. And, and, and we're actually looking at the broader role of mobile phones for self-management. We're just kind of scratching the surface here, right? And we're working with clinicians to figure out, well, how can you employ this in practice? So the bottom is an example of um, the, the, the app was actually featured at TED Med recently. And these are about 10 different uh, projects that use mobile phones as sensors. We're the only ones that actually use the phone sensors as a sensor. Uh, everybody else had an attachment or a device, but, but still, it was using the phone as a da data collection tool. And on the bottom right is kind of cool. That's uh, uh, um, uh, our, 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 our secretary, our, our attorney general, our, our uh, surgeon general, sorry, surgeon general actually using SpiroSmart, so that was actually pretty interesting. So I have a whole lung function profile, actually. Um, but, but she was actually doing a full physical 
using all 10 of those apps. So they did a full physical using a phone. So it was kind of cool to have, so people were going in to, into these booths and doing a full physical makeup, workup, um, using a phone as their tool, and that was really interesting. Um, and, so, and so we're looking at what are the broad implications for self-management and bringing these tools home um, and, and, and going through FDA and trying to figure out, well, how can we have, uh, wh what are some of the compromises that we can make as computer scientists and what FDA is looking for and what are some of the challenges there. And when we were talking to FDA, there were really interesting computer science challenges that came out that we haven't solved yet. It's like, oh, wow, that's an interesting networking problem. And so there's things that we actually don't have an answer to FDA. And so these are some things that we have to work on in parallel. So in summary, I've, uh, you know, I've talked about some, some new approaches for in-home sensing, so single point disaggregation of energy use, electricity and water, um, and then how can you repurpose the microphone in, in new ways and teach it these new tricks where you can use it as a health sensor. And a lot of this is under, uh, the underlying approach is kind of this idea of taking these unusual signals and using those as the signal of interest. Uh, signals that people don't care about, people that have ignored, and, and how can you solve these problems in other ways that you know, you're not kind of stuck in a, a, a one way of thinking about these, these, this kind of approach. Um, and we have other projects. I mean, I can't talk about it all. You can probably go to my lab website and take a look. I mean, here's some other things that we've done. Uh, there's a project that gotten a lot of press recently called YC, which is the idea of using a Wi-Fi router that you already have in a home at five gigahertz and being able to detect in-home gestures. So the Microsoft Connect detects how you're gesturing because it has a 3D camera, an RGB camera. When well, we actually figured out how you can use MIMO and five gigahertz in a commodity router to detect if you're doing a push gesture, if you're actually swinging your arm, by looking at the Doppler shift from that five gigahertz signal being reflected off you and by the MIMO receiver. And so you can actually implement this algorithm in hardware now on a router because we have the capabilities, you have five gigahertz, you have multiple antennas, and we have the computational power. Um, and so the idea here is that you can be, you know, the demo that we have is, you know, you're in a kitchen, you can, you know, um, interact with your lighting or, or, or do, you know, various things by using gesture and you don't have to have a camera everywhere. And so that's some things that we've been looking at, looking at how uh, 60 hertz signals that are radiating off the power line, how that can be used to detect motion and gestures. So there's signals everywhere. It's just things that people haven't looked at. Um, so that's an example of, you can look at that, you can check that on the website. There's lots of cool videos and demos on the website about that.